I found them in the back. Oh, okay. Him and his brother are tall. just after five o'clock so we're going to get started um, we'll say a prayer and then we will jump right in god we give you thanks again for the chance to be together and to hear your word lord guide us with wisdom guide us with love and grace that we may get to know you more through this time amen um, so uh, once again this study is called across the spectrum uh, I, I'm using a book that I get a lot of my info from called Across the Spectrum. Two guys wrote it together, uh, Paul, um, Eddie, and I forget the other guy's name. I, 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 the book's in my office. I brought it last week. I didn't get it this time. I didn't feel like going back to talk to it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's a great book. I, I really recommend it. It, it. It's got way more. It's got like 19 or 20 topics, and Paul we're only going Eddie. into six. So say again. Paul. Paul, yeah, like E-D-D-Y is his last name. Um, also, um, what, what we're doing is hearing different perspectives on different issues. And last week, we started with how to read Genesis 1 and 2. And that one is a, quote, safe one. And here's what I mean by safe. Um, very few of us have deep personal attachment as to whether or not those are six literal days or six eons, etc. There's different ways to read it. Going forward, we're going to get into issues that have deeper personal attachment. For example, this one, God's foreknowledge versus God's will, we're going to see how this leads us into the question of, does God allow tragedies or does God will for tragedies to happen to accomplish a greater good? And that strikes us all very personally. Um, so as we present the sides, again, I'm going to do my best to present them um, objectively and neutrally and just say this is this view this is that view any questions any comments let me know um, I, I just any anytime I touch on things like this just throw the preface out of um, um, be mindful not to um, be dismissive of someone else's point of view I mean if they if you think completely different than me on one of these issues I, I'd like to hear it um, but you know it doesn't mean we have to get upset with each other I mean, you know, you can call the bishop and try to get me moved if you want. Ah, but, yeah. no. <laughs> um, but you know, again, we're, we're going to look at we're going to look at different issues, and and my point in in this study is not as much to could to try to convince anyone of one side or the other, but really to show that there is a broad spectrum of of beliefs and thoughts and feelings on different issues, and and it's not just a broad spectrum that we're pulling out of the air. There are people that read the scriptures that we read and come up with different conclusions than us on certain issues. For example, when we talk about women in ministry, we know that there are denominations that say the Bible's clear. Women are not to be pastors. And there are denominations that say, well, but this is contextual, this is why. And one of these I'm, I put in here on purpose, and I'm just telling you ahead of time, you know the big vote in May to split the Methodist church is going to be over the issue of same-sex marriage. Well, I'm going to show you where one side reads the Bible and says, well, it's clear the scriptures are not okay with this. And there's another side that reads the Bible and says, no, the scriptures are clear. God is okay with this. And I'm not saying I agree or disagree. I'm just going to show you both sides. Because here's where I think I, I would really love us to come down. At the end of the day, we can still disagree with other folks, but we can hear them and love them in disagreement. It, it, we don't all have to think the same way, but we should love. So this is kind of the point of this. Um, and for us to help kind of work out some of our theology, and honestly, I love doing studies like this because I'm still working out my theology. I mean, that's that's part of life and growth. And you know, when I prepare to lead this, I, I learn a lot. And then when I hear your points of view, I learn a lot. So I appreciate these times. So jumping in this week with God's foreknowledge versus God's will. 
So um, one of the basics of orthodox Christian belief, when we say orthodox, we mean foundational, standard Christian belief. One of the basics of that, the basic tenets, is the belief that God has what they call, jokingly, the three omnis, right? Omnipotence, omnipresence, and omniscience. Meaning, God is able to do anything, God is present everywhere at once, and God knows all things. That's, that, that's pretty much standard Christian belief. So to kick off one of my theology classes in seminary, the professor posed this question. Is God omniscient? Does God know everything? Yes. Is there anything you can do to make God's knowledge wrong? No. Does God know what you're going to do tomorrow? Yes. Well, if God knows you're going to mow the grass tomorrow, do you really have a choice as to whether or not you mow the grass? People say, well, of course, yeah, you could mow it or not. But if God knows I'm going to do it, and God's knowledge can't be wrong, then do I really have a choice? And, and that's a silly scenario. But it does lead to a much deeper discussion. It, it, it does, because again, in, in navigation, whether you've navigated through the air or through the ocean, you can be one degree different from someone else, and in the beginning you look like this. But at the end, one of you ends up in Australia and the other one ends up in Northern Ireland or somewhere, because eventually we diverge. And we do need to be aware of our theology and our philosophy, because when we say things, those things carry out to certain conclusions. This discussion takes us into what is God's will versus what is God's foreknowledge. I met a young man who, who could not believe in God. And he said, when I was five, I lost my father to cancer. And people told me, well, don't worry, God has a plan. He says, wait a minute, your plan was, God's plan was to leave me without a father? Well, screw that guy. I don't want anything to do with him. That's what he said to me. See, this is, this, is, this is where it gets honest real quick, right? Somebody told him God has a plan. So does that mean that God knew his father was going to die? Or does that mean God took his father from him or God allowed? And then there's someone else who would say, okay, but if God allows, that's like saying potato, potato. Because in the state of Florida... The Good Samaritan Law is in effect. If you can do something to stop something from happening and don't, you can be held responsible. So in their mind, God is responsible even for allowing. So this discussion takes all sorts of crazy twists and turns, and it can get very emotional very quickly, especially when we suffer tragedy. So I think it is good to have an understanding of where we believe God's will and God's foreknowledge, how that all works. So the, one of the questions that's being asked here is philosophically known as, quote, the problem of evil. And we're not going to chase this rabbit hole too far because whole dissertations are written just on this one question. But the problem of evil says this. If there's an all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God who is good, then why do bad things happen? And believe me, that is a common, common question. If this God is at what you say he is, all present, all powerful, all knowing, then why do bad things happen? Why do, why do mass murderers live to be 80 years old and innocent children starve to death? Why? And those are good questions. And I think understanding God's foreknowledge versus God's will, what level of free will we do or don't have. I think all that informs how we understand this. So in order to discuss this idea thoroughly, we really have to divide it into two parts. The providence debate is one part. Providence meaning the way God governs or guides the world. And then the foreknowledge debate. So, so there's really, in the beginning, we have to branch off into two distinct discussions that are going to weave back together. Okay, so go forward. All right, 
There we go. So the providence debate. Most Orthodox Christians, again, Orthodox meaning just the standard beliefs, would agree that the scriptural position is that God is ultimately in control of the world, right? Most of us would agree that God is, for the most part, in control. Now, how much or how little, how God does or does not exert that control, those are variances. Those are things that we want to look at, and, and that's known as the providence debate. So there are two basic sides to the providence debate. How does God's providence work? And again, so I'm going to use generalizations, and I'm going to use terms or labels just for the sake of the discussion so we don't get confused. But understand, when I say there are generally two, yeah, I'm going to show two kind of extremes, and of course there are shades somewhere in the middle. Um, I, we just can't do the whole spectrum, as it were. We're just going to do our best. So, first side, all things happen according to God's sovereign will. And that is basically Calvinism. And then we see the other side is that God limits his control to enable humans to have free will, which is Arminianism. Now, neither of these views originated with Calvin or Arminius, but um, we're, we're, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So uh, we're not going to consider views like deism. Deism is not an orthodox Christian belief. Deism basically says, God said, all right, world, go and just step back. Hands off, no input, no involvement, no nothing. Um, many of our founding fathers were really more deists than, than, than personal Christians. Uh, most of the founding fathers believed in God, but um, some of a lot of the writings that chronicle their beliefs, they really saw God a little more as hands off, as abstract. So. Um, deism, and, and they're not as far as some of the deistic beliefs. We're also not going to look at process theology. <coughs> process theology says that God is still growing and evolving. As the world, as the universe grows, as it evolves, as it changes, God grows, evolves, changes with it. Um, I, I, I am not down with process theology. Um, I just now now if you say well that sounds just like my theology okay but I, I, most Orthodox Christians do not support um, process theology that, that that God is still growing we believe God is complete God is whole from the beginning okay oh and in process theology God is kind of doing his best to combat evil just as it appears yeah I, again I I can't dig it but you know all right so first Calvinism. Uh, John Calvin was a French theologian and reformer in the 1500s. Uh, he was what's known as a systematic theologian. Um, a systematic theologian is a person that set out to write out a detailed system of theology. This is what you believe and why and how and what you do and how you do it and when you say it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. John Calvin was a systematic theology, uh, a theologian. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest systematic theologians of all time. John Wesley always said he did not want to be a systematic theologian. John Wesley considered himself just more of a practical theologian, just, well, here's how it applies to life, rather than this is the system of beliefs. Okay, so the, the systematic theology of, of Calvinism, like the, the, the pillar of Calvinism is God's sovereignty. God is big and God is God. Just as the pillar of Wesleyan theology is grace, the pillar of Calvinism is God's sovereignty. And not to go too deep into Calvinism, but, but, but you have various points. Um, if you're familiar with it, there, there's an acronym for Calvin's theology called TULIP, um, total depravity, um, uh, unconditional election, uh, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So a, a um, five-point Calvinist, you know, T-U-L-I-P. I almost said L-I-L. <laughs> T-U-L-I-P. A five-point Calvinist generally believes that God decides, orchestrates, and causes all things, including who will and who won't be saved. A, a, a hardline five-point Calvinist says God has chosen some to be saved and chosen others to be redeemed, 
And really, no one can say boo about it because they're not God. God is God, and that's it. Uh, they also believe, to various degrees, that in, in a, a philosophical framework known as determinism. In other words, God has already decided what you're going to do. You, you don't really have a choice. Now, that's, that's again, there are varying degrees of that. So, um, denominations that self-identify as Calvinist in theology, most Presbyterian churches, very Calvinistic, uh, many Baptists, i got to say many, uh, did, did you know that there are like over 100 Baptist denominations? So, I mean, there, there's a lot. Um, and I don't mean that in any derogatory way, I'm just, I'm just the, the Southern Baptist Church is not the only Baptist church, there are a wide variety. Uh, United Church of Christ, and any church with the word reform, so that's an FYI, if you go to a church and they say reformed in the title or in their theology, they say we're a reformed church, they're Calvinists. Um, I, I, I had a so, Calvinist, Calvin's tulip. The T is for total depravity, and humankind can't save themselves. The P is perseverance of the saints. Well, once you're saved, you're in, and, and God carries you through. Um, the unconditional election, the limited atonement. Limited atonement means only certain ones can be saved, the ones that God has chosen. And the irresistible grace, if you're destined to be chosen, to be saved, nothing you can do about it. You're going to be saved. So I had a buddy of mine tell me that, that, that most Baptists are what they call bathroom Calvinists. They just want the TP as the tulip. So that's what a Baptist friend told me. <laughs> so um, not all Baptist churches are, are, are not all are even Calvinist, but most are not five-point Calvinists. Okay. So in Calvinism... Um, we, we find, and, and we don't have time to give them all, but we find a lot of scriptural support. I mean, listen to these things. For him and through him and for him or from him uh, are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined. See, that's, that's, they're going to pull it out and say, they, see, the Bible says it. Predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So, um, scripturally, we see a lot of writing saying God's will is going to get done. What God decides is what is going to be. According to the most rigid forms of this belief, everything. Good and bad alike comes from God. Everything. There are more extreme Calvinists that, that I have heard say, God put the tree there not to give humankind a choice. God put the tree specifically so that humankind would fall, just so God could redeem humankind and show examples of God's greatness and grace. That's what some of the most extreme forms. And I've had people tell me, well, God told... God said, no, I'm a heart in Pharaoh's heart. God told, uh, or Jesus talked about Judas in a way that says, you know what, it'd been better if you'd not been born because you ain't got a choice in this. You know, you're, you're going to do what you're going to do. So again, does God just know or is God causing? I mean, I had a guy who's a good Methodist argue with me and tell me, no, if the Bible says God chose Pharaoh for this very reason, the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart to show that God is God. Made what, what, what is called an object of wrath. That's the theological term for that. So every action, occurrence, and decision are part of God's orchestrated plan. Hard determinist says if God willed for humankind to fall into sin so that he could redeem it, displaying his grace, God chooses some to be saved. Romans 9, therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So we're seeing this, this view is not pulled out of the air, right? I mean, it's, it's a scriptural view. Okay, so there are three basic arguments in support of determinism. One, sovereignty is necessarily all-encompassing. Either God is sovereign or he isn't. Sovereign doesn't have degrees. It doesn't have shades. Either you're sovereign or you're not. 
So it's either one of the two. Second, if salvation is by grace alone, then it isn't about our choice. So if they're saying we can't do anything to be saved, if we're saying we can't be good enough, right, it's not about what anything we've done, it's about what God has done, then that not being about what we've done extends all the way to our choosing it. Because if I am choosing it and that somehow activates it, the Calvinist would say, then you're still saying it's based on something you've done. They say salvation is through God alone, period. So even your choice doesn't matter. Third, and this is, this is psychological and philosophical, no decision a person makes truly comes about by free will. Every decision is motivated by something external. There's this episode of Friends where Joey is telling Phoebe that no one does a good deed just because of the good deed. No one is truly altruistic because you're getting some kind of a reward. And she keeps trying to prove him wrong. And every time she goes, like, oh, I felt so good for doing it. He's like, ah, there's the reward, see? So the Calvinist would say, nothing truly comes from free will. You're doing it because of some external motivator. And for them, it's the will of God. So those are the basic arguments for Calvinism as it comes to the sovereignty of God. All right, Arminianism. Jacob Arminius is a Dutch theologian and reformer in the later 1500s, early 1600s. So he was after John Calvin. He wrote a systematic theology that includes the sovereignty of God. So, so Arminius says, yes, God is sovereign, but God has chosen to restrict himself. God has set up boundaries that God will not cross. And one of those boundaries is giving humankind free will. Denominations that self-identify as Arminian, Methodism, we, we are strongly Arminian. And, and in case you didn't know, uh, Methodism, 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 um, John Wesley first never set out to form a new denomination. He, he, he wanted to preach revival in the Anglican church that he loved dearly. Um, but he got in and said, basically, um, you're all kind of play acting. You think you're Christian just because you were born in England and you need to wake up. And they said, get out of here. And he said, fine, I will. And he went and preached in the streets to the coal miners and in the gin mills and boy, something great happened. Then Methodism came to America, a guy named Francis Asbury and a guy named um, Francis Coke. Francis Coke, yeah. Mm -hmm. They came over here that, and, and that's where we get Cokesbury and Asbury Methodist Church, et cetera, the seminary. But what, what Wesley did that, that I really love he wasn't a systematic theologian, but he took the best from every systematic theology. So he took some of Calvinism, and he took some of Arminianism, and he took some of Catholicism, and took some from the Moravians. Anything that was good, he said, yeah, great. And, and the funny thing is, every side accused him of being the other. Like, he, 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 was, he was accused of, of trying to bring what they called popery into the Anglican church, into the Protestant church, trying to, trying to bring the Pope in here, because back then that was a big no-no, right? But then they also accused him of teaching salvation by works. But then the other side accused him of teaching emotionalism. So it's really funny stuff. Um, Pentecostals, Assemblies of God, Church of God, United Pentecostal Church, they identify as Armenian. Some Baptists, uh, Church of the Nazarene, and there's, there's umpteen more. You know there's like 12,000 Christian denominations in the world, so I, I can't list them all there. But, all right, so some scriptural support. In Joshua, Joshua tells the people, or the Lord tells the people through Joshua, choose who you will serve. Joshua says, okay, you can choose those gods, or you can choose the gods of your, uh, uh, of your ancestors who are over here. But as for me... In my house, we'll serve the Lord. So, choose. Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not everyone who's been chosen. 
everyone who calls. James 1. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Now, John Wesley, he preached about the doctrine of what he called election. Election meaning God has said, you will be saved and you will not, and there's nothing either of you can do about it. According to Mr. Wesley, and I'm quoting from his sermon here, that doctrine makes God worse than the devil. Because, Wesley says, the devil doesn't hold the power and the grace to save, God does. But only a devil would hold that power and withhold it from someone who wanted it. So, Wesley was not good with the doctrine of election. And him and his buddy George Whitfield really butted heads over it. They, they were frenemies. They respected each other, but boy, they went at it. Because he was not okay with that doctrine. Oh, and just a side note, um, I forget, they asked either Whitfield or Wesley, did they think the other would be, did they think they would see the other one in heaven when they got there? And they said, absolutely not, because they will be so close to the throne of Jesus, and I will be so far in the back, there's no way I could spot them. So they had deep respect for one another. And Whitfield actually admitted his great respect. He was a great open-air preacher of the First Great Awakening. Um, his, his, he was the predecessor for Jonathan Edwards, who preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. George Whitfield would go out in the open fields, and thousands of people would convert. But Whitfield lamented at the end of his life in his ministry, he said, I, I made a mistake. I didn't take those who converted and organize them like Mr. Wesley did into the small groups. And had I done that, they would have stayed much more faithful. So, in, in, interesting stuff there. Okay, so Arminianism, this view ultimately allows God to control, but gives humans not only agency, but some influence over the outcome. And, and, and this is a gray line, you know? According to Arminian theology, you know, all theology, in, in my opinion, that's good is held in tension. I mean, if you look at Jesus, Jesus is fully God, and fully man. There's tension there, right? Paul, <coughs> however deep sin goes, grace goes that much deeper, but grace is not a license to sin. That t Tension, law, grace. So I see tension in Arminian theology. God is in control, yet God for some reason gives us the ability to affect outcomes. A good Arminian would ask a good Calvinist, well, if, you, if God's already chosen who's going to be saved and who's not, then why would Jesus tell us to go and do anything? Because if they're going to come, they're going to come to faith either way. And a good Calvinist would say, because he told you so, so shut up and do it. <laughs> and you know what? I, <laughs> I kind of see both sides there, right? He, he, God's in charge. Okay. Um, one of the pillars of the view of Arminianism is that salvation is by grace through faith alone. So these guys, um, you know, Martin Luther, um, sol, sola scriptura, sola fide, only the scriptures and only grace. See, one, one of those big arguments was the church was giving the scripture its authority because the church was saying the church was started before the scriptures. So that it was the church through the Holy Spirit who decided which scriptures were there. And then Luther and guys came along and said, no, 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 no. It's the scriptures that give the church its authority because that's where Jesus instituted it. I think it's a little both and. Well, you know, I get confused on a lot of these things because of what, what God did then versus what God does now. In the, in the Old Testament, we, we have a number of occasions where God was giving direct orders to go and destroy uh, whole towns, people. Cats, dogs, goats, everything. And and then he used the Babylonians to come and take over and punish the, mm -hmm. the Israelites. And then he got outdone with the whole human race and got Noah to build the ark and he killed everybody except him. And then it's, it's like 
did change his mind somewhere along the way. And then I tried everything and nothing works. And I so we will give him all these laws, the 444 laws we couldn't keep. So he boiled it down to 10. And we couldn't keep 10, so he boiled it down to two. And, you know, love the Lord with all your heart and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. We couldn't keep two, so he had to send Jesus to atone for our sins. Otherwise, we would have never made it. So, and then from, from that point on, God is love. God wasn't all love back here. So, I don't, I, I, that's why I don't like the Old Testament. Old Testament. <laughs> You know, and there's there's a spectrum of beliefs on. So just 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 take the um, the eradication of certain people groups. There are those who would say, "Well, God is sovereign." So if God chooses to wipe a bunch of people out, a good Calvinist would say, "That's God's business, right?" Who? If I argue with God, Job tried, and God said, "Were you there at the beginning when I did this and this?" No, then be quiet. So a good Calvinist would say, well, God can do it. But then as you get closer to Arminianism, you get people who would say, God knew how evil these people were, that there was no redemption. And you get more progressive people who say, well, they believed God told them to do it, but God didn't really tell them. Or that's what they understood God to be saying in the day. And then you just start to get one. Like people saying um, that God made a mistake. Um, there. In our denomination, that I love very much, in other areas of the country, we have a bishop who believes that Jesus was not divine, believes that Jesus, when he told the Canaanite woman, it's not right to take the bread and throw it to the dogs, was acting as a bigot and a racist, and fortunately overcame his narrow worldview. Man, I don't go there. I don't. I don't jive with that one, one iota. So the, yeah, there's there's a lot of views, and you know how there's there's a lot of it I read, and I get in this little spiritual struggle, saying, "What in the world is is, is why? You know, mm -hmm. why?" One of the things that's helped me, or well, a couple things, one is the balance, because like in Ezekiel, God says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he wants all to turn and to repent and live. Um, another one is trying to see, for me at least, how God has shifted with, no, not shifted, how God has shifted his, his methodology with humanity as we have come along. And, and one of those things is called progressive revelation. In other words, in the Old Testament, he knew they were vengeful. So he said, all right, look, they take an eye. The most you can take is an eye. But now that the Holy Spirit is here, now that we are ready through the blood of Christ to have the Spirit live in and guide us, we're now ready for Jesus to say, okay, that was then, but now we're going to do it this way. Now you're going to have the power to turn and turn the other cheek, etc." So I'm with progressive revelation in that sense, but it also, if we go to the extreme, gets too far off track. Because then does it stop? Where does it stop? How does it stop? Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, and, and as we look at this in the Old Testament, it's a good segue to this. You know, with, with every person having the ability to choose to accept or reject, we see God experiencing emotions like frustration, anger, disappointment. We see those things coming out, and we see it much more prevalently in the Old Testament, I think, right? The Lord was grieved that he made humankind. It, you know, it hurts his spirit. So God's angry, God's upset, God's frustrated. But we see Jesus experiencing these as well. So Arminianism says for God to experience these things, why would God experience frustration if he's the one that told him what to do? If, if, if God pulled all the strings and made them move here, then how can God be upset when they moved here? That's what the Arminianist would say. Arminian would say. Chris, what about the 
didn't fall in. Oh, oh yeah. I'll just there we're we're gonna we're, we're gonna get to that next. A hundred percent. Because that's that's one of the places I think this discussion leads is the nature of prayer. So leads us to the portion of where we discuss God's foreknowledge and the views regarding it. So there are basically three major views. The Arminian view, God knows all future free events. So God says, all right, you know, I know tomorrow Chris is going to go bump, 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 and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Calvinism says God knows, and the reason is because God said tomorrow Chris is going to go. I'm going to take him and put him like a, like a piece on a board. And, and, there, and there is a, there's a view called open theism, and this one gets a little murky. God foreknows that all, God foreknows all that shall be and may be. And there's a couple variations on that one. And, and we're going to discuss each one real quick. And that will lead us into where, where prayer does or does not play into this. So the Arminian view, God knows all events, even though we have the freedom to choose. The scriptures are full of instances where God foretells an event or series of events. And the scriptures are full of instances where God says to someone, had you done this, this would have happened. But now that you've done this, this will happen instead. So this view does mean God knows what we will do before we do it, if we hold to this view. So arguments for it. Again, if God's truly omniscient, God must know all future events. If God is sovereign, God must know all future events. Knowledge of an event and causing an event are two different things. One is active, the other is passive. In other words, God knows... And I don't want to say reacts, because that, that implies something I may not, I don't think I want to go. Maybe God reacts in advance. I had to put this way, and, and this goes into the nature of prayer as well. Let's say, let's say I know when my six-year-old gets off the bus that he wants to have a chocolate chip cookie. So I buy chocolate chip cookies at the grocery store uh, the day before. And when he gets home, he asks for a chocolate chip cookie. But when did I start acting? When did my process of giving him the cookie actually begin? Did it start when he asked? It started when he gave him the first one. Okay. Now let me ask you this. What if he didn't ask for the cookie? Would I still give it to him? Maybe. So in this one, we see God seeing what will happen. So when we pray, does that mean a different outcome would not have resulted or would have resulted had we prayed or because we didn't pray. I think it would because it says that he, he's got all these chocolate chip cookies up here for us and all we got to do is ask for them and he'll give them to us. All right, so let me... You don't have because you don't ask. Oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let me, let, me, let, me bring it, let me bring it more home. When Robbie was born, um, his, his alveoli, the air sacs in the lungs, they didn't open. So he was born, everything looked okay, then they started saying, wait a minute, his oxygen is just, he's breathing, but he's not holding it. So his oxygen plummets into the 60s. And they said, we, we, we were in Shreveport. We, we were over at um, uh, Will Knight and one of them, and they had to take us to the other ones across Shreveport. Shreveport's huge. I think it was south to the to, to, to the really fancy NICU there. They said we got to get him over there. They said sixty percent oxygen. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So we're distraught, and he's over there. He's hooked up to tubes, and he's in a box. And the first couple days, he's staying like that. And they're like, "Look, you need to prepare. This he, he may not come home." Okay. Next little bit. They said, okay, uh, looks like he's going to pull through. They've started to open, but he was down oxygen so long, he, he's going to have brain damage. Mm. Okay? Then it's, 
well, okay, we don't see any brain damage, but it takes time sometimes, and we're going to see developmental delays probably. Okay? We spent three weeks in ICU. And uh, half the Southeast was praying for this boy. And he came home, and you see the product today. <laughs> and, and here's what people said. Now, now, I want you to catch this. People said they believed it was, it was because so many people prayed. And they said things like, well, God has a plan for that boy's life. So does that mean that God did not have a plan for the ones that didn't go home? Would God have healed him had we not prayed? I'm not saying God doesn't have a plan for him, and I'm not saying don't pray. But not everybody's child comes home. And this discussion, I think, matters because we're going to talk to somebody who's like that one day. But in one word, and that's why we pray. Mm -hmm. And that's because we have faith. Mm -hmm. And all bowing down to that. And, and do we see in the scriptures God acting in response to prayer? I, I think we do. But so, so go back to that boy who said, God, you know, my dad died of cancer when I was five. Was God's plan for me not to have a dad, for me to grow up without a dad? Was that God's plan for my life? Because that's what people told him. God has a plan. God's in control. So that boy said, okay, obviously God did this then. Should he have prayed more? Why didn't God answer those prayers? You know, so Braden was born. <clears throat> he went into the NICU when he was first born as well. He was just too big. He couldn't, he couldn't get the oxygen in all of his body. And this is our first child. So he's in the NICU. And we're panicked a little bit. And you, you, you want to know how honest prayers get? Let me just tell you what my prayer was. I'll never forget this. Knelt down in that hospital room. And I said, God, I'm in youth ministry. We are Christians. We waited till we were married. We did it the right way. And 20-year-old crack whores have perfectly healthy babies. Why is mine in there? I mean, you know, when it comes to something like your kids, you get real honest real quick. You, you cut through all the fancy, frilly prayers, and you get down to the real business, right? And, and look... Uh, I know I'm talking to some folks who, who have experienced some deep loss. So I, I don't think I'm speaking a foreign language. Um, this stuff is hard. I, I think it's hard. It's hard to know what actually happens when we pray. And, and I think God's sovereignty, the way God acts or doesn't act, informs what God does or doesn't do when we pray. And I'm not, please, please don't mishear me. I'm not saying don't pray. <laughs> I'm not saying God doesn't answer prayer. I'm just saying I, I, I don't know all the answers. And again, I go back to that boy. I keep calling him a boy because I'm old enough to be his dad. It's weird to me. <laughs> what I say to him as a pastor really matters as to whether or not he eventually comes to a place where he can open his heart to who God is. I, I think. We so, talked about today in prayer having perseverance, which includes both patience and persistence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Je Jesus taught that. He said, you know, uh, a, a judge will answer a woman who knocks and knocks and knocks all night, not because he's good, but simply because she's persistent. <laughs> so when you go to your Heavenly Father in prayer, you keep going. <coughs> you keep going. That's a good question. When we pray, we pray. 
I have really begun to believe that prayer does more to move me than it does to move God. But at the same time, if you read the scriptures, there are so many times when God directly acts as a result of prayer and sometimes, and I don't get this, changes his course of action. Moses goes up there and God says, he says I'm going to kill them all. Moses says, no, don't do that. And he prays and God says, you know what? Because you prayed, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. But is that unique to Moses? We're not meant to know everything. We're, we're finite as human beings that don't have that understanding. There's that a good Calvinist. We will never have, we will never have that understanding, I don't believe. And, and, and honestly, that's where the Calvinist comes down. And I don't mean that in any derogatory. I mean, the Calvinist says... God is sovereign, and there's just things we ain't going to understand. And if, we, if we had all the answers, we wouldn't need God. Who would we need all the answers? We had all the answers. We understood everything. You, you know what my greatest in the Bible? Uh, the, 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 there's a few great statements of faith. The Old Testament statement of faith. But that's what this boils down to, right? The Old Testament statement of faith that to me is the greatest in the Old Testament is um, the three Hebrew children. The king, I'm going to throw you in the fire. He said, God can save us from the fire. But even if he doesn't, it don't matter. We're not going to bow down. You're not God. Even if he doesn't, that's, that, that, that's some serious prayer. <laughs> some serious faith. Why does Calvinists pray? To get us closer to God. And because he told us to. <laughs> um, that's right. But, but I, I, I would say... I would say the Calvinist view of this is more that it moves us closer to God. And the Arminian view is probably a little more that it moves God in response to us. Okay? Well, we all have the relics, I guess, a fast food mentality when it comes to prayer like that. Mm -hmm. If we don't see the results of it right away, we start questioning it. You know, I, I, I've had both things. I've had, I've, had, I've had prayers that he answered immediately. And I've had prayers that he, he never did answer those things. I don't think he did. Mm -hmm. so. And ones that God didn't answer, or maybe God answered in a way that we weren't even able to perceive, but it was an answer. Yeah. Potentially. Be like Bobby Goldenboro song, you know, I thank God for unanswered prayers. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the Calvinist in, in, in this view of God's knowledge and God's will uh, scriptures are full of instances where God decides something happens, someone will act in a specific way, God says they're going to do this so is God just telling what's going to happen or is God deciding it the Calvinist view again, God knows everything because God has decided and caused it now this view refuses not only the idea of chance or randomness but it says that God intentionally orchestrates everything because sovereignty, again, is all or nothing. So, arguments for the Calvinistic view again on this side. What if God sent a person to accomplish something eternally important? What if he sends a missionary who can preach and save the souls and a storm were to hit that boat and kill that missionary and they never get to him? So basically they're saying... God's not going to leave it to chance. God's going to orchestrate it. God's going to decide it. If God knows something bad that will happen and doesn't stop it, isn't that worse than causing it for good? So the Calvinist would say, the, the hard, most hardline Calvinist would say that everything that happens, God not only allows, God causes. Because they say, again, God having the ability to stop it but not stopping it is worse than causing it. Because at least in causing it, God has orchestrated. And they use, in Romans, God works everything together for the good of the, you know. So this one, what does this say about the nature of prayer? That was the, the question I think you had, David. What does this the Calvinist say about prayer? I think prayers for the Calvinist would be just to get us on God's page more than anything. All right. Briefly, open theism. This view says that God knows what will come to pass, but in another sense, sees things that could go one way or the other and sees them as open possibilities. There are some open theists 
that say that God sees like, you know, your life tangentially shooting off like all these different ways and all these possibilities and has things prepared for each one of them. There are some that say that God sees your next choice and sees all the possibilities but doesn't know yet. And that's bordering on process theology, but not quite. And open theists would say God has solutions ready for whatever option comes. That just sounds really confusing. <laughs> okay, but look at these. Look, Jeremiah, perhaps they will listen and each will turn from their evil ways. Then I will relent and not inflict on them disaster I was planning. God tells Jeremiah, go, go speak to them and perhaps they'll repent. That's, that sounds almost like open theology there. Well, you know, I'm going to send you to do it. And they might turn, they might not. Um, was God just testing Jeremiah's obedience? Or is God really saying, okay, there's, there's just a possibility here. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel, therefore, son of man, pack your belongings for exile. In the daytime, as they watch, set out and go from where you are to another place. Perhaps they will understand. Well, they are a rebellious people. God seems to speak in an open fashion as to the outcomes here, right? I mean, those look fairly open-ended. But isn't that more just like, you're going, it's their free will as to if they accept it or not. But if God knows if they won't accept it, why even send them? That's what the open theist would say. Okay. Say, okay, but th then if God knew they wouldn't, then God would say, yeah, don't worry about it. You know, wipe them out like the Amorites. Done. Right. But there's others who say that God is testing the prophet's obedience there. So, okay. So, uh, good, good question. Argument supporting this view. If God knows what we'll do with certainty, then do we really have a choice? So back to the mow the grass thing, right? An open theist would say, there have to be options. God's knowledge has to include the options, or else it's not really a choice. There's, there, there, there's a fantastic book, and, and I want to say it's called The Necessity of Hell. And the idea is that for us to ultimately have free will, there must be an ultimate choice that rejects God. Otherwise, in the end, it is universalism. They say for free will to be a real concept, then hell must be 100% real, or else there's no real choice at the end of it all. Second, open theism would say, why would God create people like Adolf Hitler unless there was a chance for them to turn out differently? Why would, why would God allow a person to come into being who God knows, whether he chooses it or not, who God knows is going to cause millions upon millions to suffer horribly unless there was a chance. Now, if God knows there's no chance, then why even create him? <clears throat> weeds, and, weeds and crops, maybe. The wheat and the tares. That's a parable Jesus told. Why would he create anything bad, though? Why in But if God knew they were going to choose that different path, then why even let them come to be in the first place? That's what the open theist would say. Well, if that was the case with all sin, why would he want to create evil? Good question. Not that we're evil, but sin separates us from him. So. Good questions. So, what does open theism say about the nature of prayer then? Sometimes being an open theist might be a little easier, right? Because God's saying, all right, if you pray, I can get in and, you know, make something happen here. Interesting. Okay, summary. God's providence. Calvinism says God wills and decides everything. Arminianism says that God allows us to decide the future with our free will to choose. Let me just tell you that the Methodist Church is distinctly Arminian with hints of Calvinism. 
For the first one, God's providence. Where do you see yourself on that spectrum? Say, say, Armi say Calvinism is a 10, and say Arminianism is a 0. Like the 10 is God absolutely controls everything, period. And the zero is God allows everything to go by however free will dictates. What number would you say you are? I'm curious. A ten of like point five. A point five. Yeah. So 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 you're way over in the free will randomness. Like God allows random events to occur. Okay. Good. Arminianism has to also include our ability to change God's will constitutionally. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So prayer is a big part of it, and that's why we petition and why. why yes, Ar Arminianism might, well, so there we get into a tricky thing. Does it change the will of God, or does it finally put us on? God's page for what God's will is. We are receptive to whatever God's will is. I mean, okay. Well, we'll know that when we get it. <laughs> all right. So I'd like to hear some more numbers. I'm just really curious. God controls it all, or, or God lets it all go as it will? Now, I'm not saying God doesn't work over here, and that God doesn't <laughs> still protect and provide, but what number are we? I, I have often said it's easier to be a Calvinist, isn't it? Just say, well, this is God's decision, and God is God, and we can trust God. Okay? Where are we at? 37. 37? <laughs> 30, 70. 30, 70. So, which, which direction? Mostly Arminianism? Well, you're a three out of ten. Okay, so, so, so you'd be about a three. You, you'd be 30% free will, or 30% God's control and 70% free will, roughly? Yeah. Okay, so, so about a three, all right? Yeah, about a six. A six, yeah. When you look at the Bible and see what the Bible has as far as God's will and his actual. I see cases for I see cases for all of it. I mean, mm -hmm. so yeah, I see biblical evidence for all three, honestly, and life experience. Yes. Oh, so Mr. Wesley, he 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 understood the Christian faith through experience. This is how I see God working. This is how I've experienced it. I've seen others experience it. I, I'm, I'm really curious. Give me some other numbers. I, li I like to hear. There's no right or wrong answer. Calvinism. So you're closer to 10. Calvinism. Hey, uh, that, and, and none of these views are unscriptural. And, and that's kind of the point I'm making, you know, is, is, is there, there's basis for all of it. And see, a good Calvinist would say, God would not risk the salvation of the world on Judas's decision not to betray Jesus. A good Calvinist would say, that encounter, there's too much at stake. So, that's going to happen. 
Now, a good Arminian would say, well, but God knew Judas wasn't going to turn. Not that God didn't want him to turn. And a good open theist would say, well, if Judas hadn't have done it, God had some other way worked out. It would have been fine. It had to come about. It, it was, it, it, it was going to happen, and it had to happen. And, 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 and again, it, it they already know. the extremes are all or nothing, but there are shades in the middle here. Mm -hmm. So th then a question would be, you know, does a, do certain people who are certain degrees of criminals, do they always have a choice? Some people would say, yes, everyone has a choice, but other people, mental health professionals would say, no, they've got things that are, wires that are crossing they're not in control of their actions. They, they are unduly influenced by other things. I've never understood the mental illness uh, aspect of our existence. Why do we have mental people who are extremely mentally ill and cannot overcome it? And that's and that's that that's that's one of those great and hard questions. Um, and. When we, when we get into the same-sex discussion, that's going to be a big talking point. Okay, um, so where's the UMC on this? Decidedly Ar Arminian with smatterings of Calvinism. If I had to give the UMC a number, probably somewhere between a four and a six. As I said last week, we're the church of the extreme center. We, we really are middle of the road in our theology because Mr. Wesley was very balanced. And, and I like that. I, I like the balance there. Um, where do I stand personally? Um, sometimes I'll give you this, sometimes I won't. On this one, I, I, I agree with you, Beth Ann. It would be easier to be a Calvinist. Um, but I just see a lot of evidence for God giving us the ability to affect the world around us. For, for some reason, I, I believe God has chosen to limit his influence to a degree. Now, to what degree that is, I don't know. At the end of the day... I know who is God and I know who ain't, and I ain't. And that's good news. But you know who's parent and who's not, and you are the parent. You yes. are the father. Yes. You're the head of your household. I am the father. God is my father. He's the right. head of my household. Right. And, 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 that's my Calvinist and, view. And, that's, and, 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 and Calvinist. that's a very scriptural view. I mean, there's. Um, so now looking at God's foreknowledge and, and wrapping up with this one. Um, God knows because God chose. God knows, but we choose. And it's all open. Which one of the three do you think you align most with? God knows, but we choose. Okay. He knows what we're going to choose, mm -hmm. I think. I think of it in regards to my life. A couple of years ago, In hindsight, I didn't really think that like that was my choosing. Like I, out of impatience, out of fearing of being alone or whatever, I was being painful. I made a not smart decision. But she's not talking about marrying me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Clarify, please. If anybody doesn't know, I was married before. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, not smart decision. <laughs> and they found that out. <laughs> um, you know, but, and I really 
you know, we that that taps into another discussion we don't have time to have, but if God is inherently good, some of the things we consider evil, uh, a, a good Calvinist would consider them necessary evil. Uh, in other words, a surgeon performs or, or inflicts a minor evil upon your body by cutting you open. I mean, that's that's painful. But it's to serve a greater good of getting an infected organ out. So there are those who would say that all circumstances, however painful, God caused in order to accomplish something greater. And they look at the crucifixion of Christ or the stoning of Stephen, which was the spark that sparked the church. So, um, again, this question matters because of that guy I talked to. That young man, it matters because when we suffer loss, when we suffer tragedy, I would urge us, I would encourage us to be mindful of our wording when someone is in the midst of tragedy because sometimes we struggle for answers and the correct answer is, I don't know and I'm so sorry but you can trust that God is good and that God still loves you. God will see you through this, whatever that looks like. I was at a funeral for a woman in Monroe a few years ago. Her 40-year-old husband died of a sudden heart attack overnight, left three boys. One of them was a year and a half. The two boys were up at the, at the coffin during the funeral. Very painful. And I talked to the woman, I said, eventually your boys are going to be okay. Someone said to me later on, well, how can you say they'd get over it? I'll never, I said, I didn't say they'd get over it. I said, eventually they'll be okay. Because God is good, and God can bring us through. God can and will work things for good if we allow it. So, any closing thoughts or questions or I just have to say, uh, my all-time favorite scriptures are Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1. In the beginning was the Word, and the in, begin, in the beginning God created these, the heavens and the earth, and the earth was good. And then John 1-1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was good. And I just believe that constitutes my foundation and my personal philosophy of Calvinism. It is all good. God's omniscient, omnipresent, omniscient. All of the omnis, whatever they are. And I just trust him and I believe him and I cast my faith upon him. And so I'm Calvinistic, Calvinistic to the end. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not to Kool-Aid anything or you know make anything sugar-coated. It's just a trust, a faith, a firm belief in a a foundation of my convictions of my faith. Sure. And throughout all this discussion we've talked with the theologians and everything, somebody said the devil made me do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> where did you come in? The agency of the Satan, the accuser, is a whole other study. <laughs> you just uh, individual sentient entity or the little voice in each of us that pulls us away. Some would say it's one, some would say it's the other, some would say that's a potato potato, it still looks and tastes the same. That is a very interesting discussion and maybe maybe one of my studies after this one needs to be on that very, the, the spiritual entities in there. That would be a good one. So, going back to Genesis, I don't read it literally, I read it as a poem, so yes, because I think the serpent was just a personification of our temptation to veer from the path that God has set out. So, for my answer, yes. Do you think, do you think there would be some, some presence at some point that would, that would lead them astray and, and lead them to make, to make a choice between good and evil? I... I do. Um, because I think God wants us to choose him. I don't right. think he wants us in a relationship. He wants us to say, God, I want you. 
doesn't have good genes because that's what we were cleared off. Right. Right. We're not robots. Right. That's why we're yeah. lost. With all these thoughts in our heads, the one thing we need to remember and the one thing that holds true to us is that if we're to emanate Jesus, we're to ask God that his will be done. Mm-hmm. 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 Jesus submitted to God's will in the highest regard, even when it was displeasant, even when he didn't want it, when he said, hey, if there's another way, I'd like to do it the other way, but your will, not mine. Yeah? That's, that's the main thing. Do you think we're the only thing in God's whole creation that is rebelling against him? Do you think we're the only part of his creation So if you if you if you look at nature, um, I believe nature is amoral. I don't think it's good or evil. I think it just does what it does. And and a, a common misconception: people say when God created the world, He created it perfect. Scripture never said that. Scripture say it was good. And then when it comes to man, it was the double good, the good good. Um, so there are early church fathers who believe that natural disasters occurred before the fall. There's some that say sin brought all that in. Well, we don't we don't have concrete evidence of that. It could have been there. And then as far as uh, your question could go an, another step further and say are we the only sentient life in the universe and could that be rebelling or following? Whew. <laughs> <laughs> it's something to think about. I I, I don't know. Um, that is something to think about. It's a good question. Okay, um, anybody got their bulletin handy? What's uh, what's next week? Here's one. Oh, it's not in the bulletin from, the, this, from today. Yeah, can you have it? Uh, yeah, it was. Oh, it was? Yeah, yeah today okay. at 3-8. I, I just didn't mention it. Uh, on 315, we have... The fate of the unevangelized. The fate of the What are the people who never hear the name Jesus? Believe it or not, that's not a cut and dry deal. There's scriptural evidence for a variety of beliefs in there. And we'll talk about that. So, hey, good discussion. Thanks, everybody. I had fun.